Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us on another episode of Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah and I'm here with my dad, Pastor Craig Roeders. Hey. Today we have a very special guest. He is the pastor of Calvary Chapel, Signal Hill, and we are going to be talking about eschatology and end times and how pastors need to stand up for truth. So without further ado, it's my honor and privilege to welcome Pastor James Cadiz. Pastor James, thanks so much for joining us today. So glad to be able to do it. It's an honor. Yes, we're blessed to have you. And But before we get started, Dad, would you like to pray for us? Yes. Father, we just thank you for this day, and I thank you for Pastor James making time to be here. And I just pray you'll just bless this time. We commit it to you, Lord, as your word says, whatever you commit to, Lord, it shall be established. We pray you'll guide our tongues, you'll guide what we say. We pray there'll be really clarity today about kind of the, the, the pre-trib and the dominionist, just to explain what's going on and mm-hmm. how we should be engaged as Christians in the balance, Lord. There's some people say we're winning, some people say we're losing everything, but Lord, help us as Christians, to discern the times, to know what's going on, to really to know how we can really be salt and light, how we can occupy until you come. And so, Father, that we would go out swinging. We wouldn't be those wicked, lazy servants that just sit on our hands. Help us, Lord, to be as shrewd as serpents, yet as innocent as doves. Bless this time, and thanks. We commit it again to you in Jesus' most powerful name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're excited to have a conversation with you. We always tell everyone, we're like, it's not an interview, it's a conversation. <laughs> we like to talk a lot, so <laughs> everyone always gets mad at us, but um, it is a conversation, so we're excited We watched your interview with Rob, and he liked to talk a lot. On your yeah, interview, he talked, so. he yeah. talked. <laughs> I think the last interview, he just decided that he was just going to let guest. me take over, which was, a, I didn't even know that was going to happen. So. <laughs> You're like, all right. You're I think that's what we're going to do with you today. We'll no, let no, you no, take no, over, because no, no. you yeah. know more, and... Um, We're just blessed to have you. We know that you are the pastor at Calvary Chapel, Signal Hill. Is that, that's in Uh LA, right? Yeah. So if you think of the city of Long Beach, where Signal Hill is a city that is literally in the middle of Long Beach. Long Beach surrounds the whole city of Signal Hill. Okay. It's, uh, uh, yeah, but yes, the LA area. That's Uh awesome. And then um, you also speak, I heard you speak seven languages. First of all, is that true? And what languages do you speak? Yeah, it's, this is, oh my goodness, this is, these guys, oh, they always talk about all of this stuff. That is so funny. Well, my mom and my dad were both born and raised in Egypt, so of course I speak Arabic, and uh, there's, the kind of Arabic that I speak is recognized in lots of other countries because there's different dialects or whatever. I read biblical languages, of course. Uh, I have some acclimation as well with Latin because I had to in the area of textual criticism. I speak some Spanish um, you know, have, uh, some acclimation with the Russian language, uh, just because I spent some time over there. And so I figured I needed to learn the language to be able to get that, uh, get that kind of solid and down. So, uh, yeah. So I have a little bit of a background in that. <laughs> just a little bit. I'm like, I'm I can barely speak down. English. Yeah, exactly. so. <laughs> so, so I'll tell you, so I'll tell you where this comes from. One of my very first interviews with Rob my sister starts bragging about me right in front of Rob, and then that's and then Rob ran with it, okay. and so that's kind of where all of that goes. And now Charlie Kirk runs with it yep. all the time, and yeah, God and that's bless what we guys. we like about you is like you are humble, but we're like we're gonna have to say a little bit for you, yeah, you know, yeah, because yeah. <laughs> you're not gonna do it for yourself. You're so say, your hey, sister, remember this. <laughs> your sister's gonna have to say it for you. Uh, so, um, <laughs> and then we the, what we're really excited about is you have. Um, updates right every you said every week prophecy updates and that's why we like your background with israel but you have prophecy updates so we we want to talk about today you know end times eschatology you know as calvary cca we believe in pre-trib pre-mill and um, we want to explain how just because there's you know, dominionists who say, oh, you guys just are trying to like Jesus Escape. take the wheel, like <laughs> don't do anything. That's not true. We we know we have to occupy. We know we're not supposed to be the wicked, lazy servant. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But um, for you, can you just maybe share a little bit about what it means to be, you know, pre-trib, pre mill A lot of people don't even understand end times. We watched the movie, it's called Before the Wrath, and it was talking about how most churches don't even like talk about prophecy. They won't even touch the book of like Revelation. My dad was in it for how many years? <laughs> <laughs> I, I still don't understand. If I've taught it, I think the first time was a year, almost two years, and then the second time was a year and a half. Yeah, I think, yeah so. but it's important. So I'm going to give it to you now. So why is that important? Can you explain a little bit of 
you know, how you even got into it maybe and why it's important for well, us to study. Okay, so, so the reason why it's so important is because it's the single greatest purifying influence in the church. Yeah. Mm. If the church has the expectation that Christ is coming, Jesus then that Christ. expectation will motivate them to righteous living. Amen. Like you said, you know, you don't want to be the wicked slothful servant. But, but it, it gets deeper than that because if you know that Christ can come at any minute, then it is going to be your heart's desire to give it everything you have. Amen. The person who has the mindset that says, well, Christ is coming back soon, so let's just let it all go to the proverbial hell, mm. that's not a person who understands our eschatological point of view. Which, by the way, when we use the phrase eschatology, it just basically means the study of end times. That's yeah. really what we're talking about here. There's no need uh, for me to get into all of the different type of because uh, there can be some really confusing pieces of terminology as it relates to that. But but it, the bottom line is, is that when you, uh, if you believe that Christ could come at any moment for his church, then you as his church are going to do everything that you can to be get, to, to literally get caught doing uh, that which is right in the eyes of God. Hmm. And so, you know, when I stand up for things going on in this country, when I'm seeking to get involved in, in the political issues and all the other things that are going on, I'm doing it as an act of obedience to God because God asks me to stand up for righteousness. Amen. It's the very reason why since the coronavirus has started, I will do at the bare minimum one short video every single day, Sunday through Sunday. And it's the reason why we do live updates at least uh, two or three times a week. It's the reason why we do all the Bible studies. We're producing anywhere from between, I don't know, 13 to 15 videos a week wow. uh, because it's our responsibility to do that. Sometimes it's less. Sometimes we'll do nine or ten. But um, uh, that's why I'm doing it, because I recognize the fact that I don't have a lot of time. And if I don't have a lot of time, then I think it's my obligation to, to actually speak out and, uh, and to be aggressive. Uh, maybe, maybe that's not the right word. Yeah. Assertive Amen. about the fact that, you know, hey, listen, Christ is coming and we need to be ready for it. And the only way that I can think of being ready for it, besides understanding and knowing the times and, and being aware of what the scriptures teach concerning all of those things, is also get involved and initiate uh, that type of thing. And uh, this is perhaps one of the most erroneous conclusions uh, that you'll find with many people who stand with the dominionist point of view, and oftentimes with the point of view that's uh, related to those uh, that are assigned to certain camps, uh, that we as premillennial, pre-tribulational Christians... Yep. Uh, don't really believe in getting involved or anything like that. And that just, sim there could be nothing further from the truth. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you really understand the premillennial, pre-tribulational view, then you will recognize the fact that it's God's call upon our life to actually stand firm. And let me actually take it a step further uh, for those of our members of our audience that doesn't understand what that means. When I say premillennial, pre-tribulational, what I'm basically saying is I'm saying that Jesus, I believe that Jesus Christ is going to rapture his church. Amen. When the rapture takes place, and there's a lot of things in the timeline, right? I mean, right before the rapture, the dead in Christ rise, you know, uh, trumpet sound. So the whole idea is we get raptured, right? And then when we get raptured, we begin to see kick into um, kick into motion what we call the 70th week of Daniel, which pretty much is the tribulation, mm -hmm. right? We see the second coming of Christ at the at the termination of that time period, what they call the second coming of Christ. Oftentimes people conflate the second coming of Christ with the, with the rapture, mm -hmm. and they're two completely different events, yep. Yep. right? And then, and then we will go into a millennial period, we call it the millennial reign of Christ, where we will uh, rule with him, right? And this does not imply that we have any kind of superiority over Christ or, or equality in the sense of we now become gods mm -hmm. ruling over the earth. That's not the case, but but that's basically what it means. And then at the end of that, we know that God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth, and there's a lot in the middle of that. Now, here's the here is the part that people oftentimes accuse us of, and and there, for good reason because there's a lot of people who are uneducated in this area mm -hmm. who don't understand the scriptures the way they ought to understand the scriptures, and then come to these erroneous conclusions. This is perhaps where the major mistake ends up getting made, and it gets made a lot. Right? Is they say, well, Jesus Christ is coming back soon. So who cares mm. uh, what I'm doing at the current moment? Uh, look, I can just put a bunch of money on my credit card and I don't have to worry <laughs> about paying it back because yeah. yeah. God's going to come back in a few years. Or, you know, people develop that mentality. Well, people did actually, that. If you remember 86 oh, yeah. reasons why Jesus is going to come back in 86, I don't know if you're uh, Christian. Oh, yeah. I remember oh, people yeah. ran up their credit cards and just did it. It's like, are you Absolutely. kidding me? Yeah, it really Absolutely. has happened. I mean, it's not some, yeah. 
So. Yeah, then it was in 1948, Jesus yeah. is going to come back, and then they said 1998, then 2008, then 2018, and now the new thing is 2022. Hmm. And, and I'm not, look, Peter addressed this issue, right? God's not slack concerning his promise, so we don't look at the things that people say and then use that as a, a functional determinant to, to basically say, well, Jesus is coming back because, look, we thought all these things in the past, and look, he's not here. But, but the point is, is to understand the scriptures and know what the scriptures teach. And so if, if you believe the things that I just described, well, then you'll go to a passage like 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Now, I know this is a controversial view, but if you really study it, and Andy Woods did a really good job on this, if you really study 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, you'll find out when it talks about the departing or when it talks about apostasy, right, that is not talking, that is not referring to a Christian backsliding. What 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is talking about is when Christians get raptured, then the evil one is going to come on the sea. By the way, Don Stewart believes this as well. Okay. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, debate and everything when we went and talked about this. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3 basically says that the Antichrist cannot be revealed to the world until Christians actually depart from yeah. this world. So until right. the rapture happens. Yeah. And then the reason why he gives this is when you jump down to, I think it's around verse 7, he says, look, the reason why this is the case is because Christians that are filled with the Holy Spirit act as the restraining force mm -hmm. in this world to keep all of that evil from coming into fruition. Now, if that is the case, it's not just a simple issue of identity. Oh, well, you know what? Christ lives inside of me, so uh, be just simply because of my my presence here, it puts that restraining force from the evil one coming in. No, it's not as simple as that. Yes, there is a, a an issue of presence that does make that happen, but it also speaks to the expectation that God has placed upon believers to take a stand for righteousness. Mm -hmm. And that's why, in essence, we practically are that restraining force, because we are the people that are keeping evil at bay from when that happens, which is a far cry from the mindset of the Dominionist camp, as you guys yeah. had mentioned uh, earlier. Pastor James, with that, so, because we want to be kind of try to be like, I don't know if we should say Fox News anymore, nobody likes Fox News, <laughs> but fair and balanced, of what would you say to the pre-trib, pre-mill who's like us, that kind of has that let go of the wheel and let Jesus take it, and I kind of want things to get worse because I know God's going to come back. You know, it's, it's going to get worse before it gets better. What What would you say? Would you Would you say wicked, lazy servant? What would you say is the wrong mindset that believes like that? Because that's what the Dominionists accuse us mm -hmm. of is kind of not being occupying, not being involved, giving up. So what would you, how what would you say to that person who believes like us, but maybe has kind of let go of the wheel? What would you say? Yeah, I don't. So I don't want to be offensive when I say this, and my heart is never to be belligerent just for the sake of shock value. But I would tell those Christians that they need to study the Word, yeah. hmm. right? Because we know that the Bible tells us that in the last days things are going to get worse. Hmm. Of course, it's going to get worse, but it does not mean that as Christians we should capitulate to the mindset of the world as they continue to go in a dark direction. The Bible tells us to take a stand for righteousness. Amen. The Bible tells us uh, to defend those that cannot be defended. The Bible tells us to literally stand our ground. That's what the whole uh, the whole book of Timothy yeah. was written for. Yeah. Right? To restrain evil. To, to right. basically walk away from sound doctrine. Uh, these people are walking away from sound doctrine, and he was saying, look, you need to make a commitment to preserve it. So so uh, we as, as we see the day approaching... Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 tells us this. Hey, listen, don't forsake the gathering together Amen. right, Amen. of one another as you see the day approaching. What day is he talking about? Well, the Amen. day of Christ coming for his church. Amen. So the whole idea is you don't abandon the process. You don't walk away from the obligations that have been given to us and afforded to us to be good stewards of the nation that we live in. I mean, God told this to Jeremiah. Jeremiah knew. He knew that God was going to destroy the southern kingdom. Mm. He knew that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. His ministry started somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 years before the very first siege by Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar sieges Jerusalem for the first time in 605 BC, somewhere around there. Then the next time in 595, and finally the, the last siege that completely destroyed Jerusalem was in 586 BC. That's when Jeremiah lamented over it. He was called the crying prophet, and that's why he wrote the book of Lamentations. Those, that was why he was crying over but the whole bottom line is god tells jeremiah to seek the peace of his nation mm -hmm. so so when you think about this he was still doing everything that he could to engage 
in the political arena. As a matter of fact, the only time Jeremiah actually opened his mouth in, in, in a majority of his ministry, not all of them, but a majority of his ministry was to engage the political class mm. of his time. Yeah. Daniel is the same way. Daniel gets taken away. He was, he was a member of the royal family in the southern kingdom. He gets taken away. And the reason why we know that is because of his position that the king was holding him fast to, right? And so they put him there to, for him to be a eunuch, to serve the king as potentially an officer. And what does Daniel do? Daniel seeks to be able to engage the political arena, and he did it with multiple administrations. He didn't just do it yeah. with, with Nebuchadnezzar. He did it with all kinds of other people, right? So you, you have to understand that the, 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 the call that God has given to us is to engage where we're at, you know, no matter of what's going to happen. I mean, I even remember reading about Ezekiel for the first time and being blown away. Who Ezekiel was a contemporary of Daniel. He was a contemporary, of course, of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was on one side telling the southern kingdom, hey, listen, Nebuchadnezzar's coming and he's going to destroy you. And then those that were taken away in the first, the second, and the third siege, remember, Ezekiel was taken away in the second siege. So he mm -hmm. enters into Babylon around 595 BC. And his whole ministry is Jeremiah is saying, hey, repent, because Nebuchadnezzar's coming. And then he finally says, doesn't matter. Just make sure you surrender so you don't die. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Then Ezekiel, after the second siege, when he's placed in Babylon and God gives him a vision, he says the message to them is, those of you that have already been taken and you're here in Babylon, don't unpack your bags, okay? I mean, pack, uh, literally, uh, not don't don't keep your bags packed. Sorry, unpack your bags yeah, you're gonna because you're going to be here for a long time. Right. And it was, in essence, a, a reiteration of uh, God's repudiation on Israel failing to be uh, to literally follow the land, the Sabbath, Sabbath of the land, years, yeah. right? And that's why we get the 70 years, because for 490 years, Israel, the southern kingdom in particular, did chose not to obey God's law in giving the land rest every seventh year. And by the way, understand, it was the southern kingdom who was considered to be the godly remnant mm -hmm. of the nation of Israel, especially after the civil war, and they ended up breaking up and going through all that they went, and yet God chose to punish Israel on the basis of what the southern kingdom chose to do or not to do. Mm. So again, it goes right back to the idea that we are called by God to live not only righteously, but we're called by God to take a stand in the political arena and every other arena that we can, not because we have the dominionist mindset that mm. says we're going to bring the kingdom in mm. and our will is the greatest power of God. That's heretical. Yeah. It's mm. actually, it's, it is, it's not only heretical, but it's, it's a direct repudiation to the will of God as stated in the scriptures. When I say I'm a dominionist, I heard a dominionist recently say something to the effect of, well, the greatest power that we have here on earth is the will of man. <laughs> okay, well, we, uh, so we, I have a real problem with that yeah. statement yeah. because Jesus Christ himself ignored his will when he went to the cross. Yeah. When you look at the story of Jesus, Jesus didn't go to the cross willingly. No. You're out of your mind if you think he went to the cross willingly. Mm -hmm. He went to the cross obediently. He was, he was in, on the garden. He was saying, look, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Father, if there's any way you can make this cup pass, let, let, me, let it pass. So the whole idea of man's will being the most powerful force on the earth is really truly a satanic yeah, ploy yeah. to get man to want to put things in their hands and think that somehow they're going to usher the kingdom of God into the earth when God said, hey, my kingdom is not made of these things. Amen. He goes on to say, store your treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroy. Now, what if, if Jesus was a dominionist, <laughs> there's no way in the world he would speak language like yeah. that. So He'd say, let's fight that here. Yeah. Mindful of. That's right. Yeah, Absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, can you speak on that, Pastor James? Is that... That because we have a guy, we won't say his name, right? You said, but we have a guy in Phoenix that's a very big dominionist, very popular on YouTube, who says, you know, Calvinist, who says that we're winning. He actually said that a couple months ago with abortion thing. We're winning. And I'm just like, I, I don't mean to be, like you said, I don't want to cause trouble, but I'm like, what are you smoking, bro? I mean, do you watch the news? But it's like, what, what do you say? I mean, you talked a little bit about that, but what do you say to that thinking that believes? Because that's been around a while. I mean, I remember people yeah, shredding. Yeah, uh, it was Bush's uh, uh, speechwriter. was a, It seems like he was a Presbyterian, Calvin, and kind of shredding Trump, saying he's appealing to all these loser Christians that think we're going to lose. And if they really understood, we're supposed to dominate and take, you know what I mean? So saying all that, what do you say about the dom? I mean, can you explain to us, kind of unpack, get in their mindset of how they think, that they're winning and that we're going to usher in the kingdom of God and just maybe the theological, but just the mindset, because I'm going, you said it's heretical, 
but it's also you're you're not living in reality, right? I mean, I remember there's a movie that says, I like fiction, but I live in a little place called reality. I don't know yeah. how you could truly say that we're winning right. and really be engaged in the news, right? So, so let me just simply say this. Although we're not naming names, I, I do <laughs> want to make one statement. I will say this. The, the person that you're referring to, I will give him more credit than most Christians out there. Heck, yeah. I'll give him more credit than yeah, most Christians out there. Yeah, because he's working. Oh, yeah. He is working because hard. he's bold. Amen. Um, he's intelligent. Amen. And he is making a change in the world with respect to the issue of abortion yep. and many other issues. I mean, yep. God has used him in a tremendous way. Yeah. And somebody Church is that growing I've, com- I've, tremendously. Well, and, and I've come to admire his stand against wickedness and evil. I think that God has used him tremendously. I think God has uh, allowed him... Uh, allowed his ministry to grow to be able to do the things uh, that he that he does, a- and he is making a great change. But the erroneous portion, I don't want to talk about him. I just want to just say things in general. The Gosh. erroneous, uh, the erroneous conclusion that people come to when they say it's all about uh, taking over these things and bringing the kingdom to this earth is really simple. Jesus condemned it. Jesus actually said, you know, he made it very, very clear that the uh, that the kingdom that we're seeking to pursue, right, is not the one that we should be pursuing on this earth. Mm-hmm. His di- his disciples were people who were looking for political uh, relief. They were mm-hmm. looking they were looking to see Jesus deliver them from the oppressive Romans, mm-hmm. as they would call it. And Jesus said, "Listen, that's not what I'm here for. The deliverance that I'm talking about, the very things that I want to bring to the picture." For you is to understand that I'm talking about deliverance from something you you don't have the foreseeability to understand, hmm. and that's the condition of your heart. That's the problem of sin. That's all of those things. And he's made that very clear. If if the dominionist mindset was correct, why would God destroy the heavens and the earth <laughs> and give us a new one? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's something to to think about. And then the motivation to take over this kingdom. Here's my problem. Why would we ever want to do something like that? This, look, mm. this earth is going to be the closest thing to hell a Christian ever sees, yeah. yep. right? And, and if you're not gets. a believer, then this this earth will be the closest Best. thing to heaven yeah. you'll ever see. And I understand why you'll want to do everything Preserve to kind of make it right. But, but this has nothing to do with wanting to stand uh, up to make the world a better place because that's what God wants us to do to usher in the kingdom. No, we do the things that we do and we take the stands that we take and we fight abortion on every end Amen. and we adopt and we do all the things that we're supposed to do because God has told us to do it. It's a simple uh, yielding to the command of God. That's what it is. And the mindset, even Paul talked about it. He said, God forbid that I would take advantage of the grace of God by simply continuing to sin. Hmm. Do I yeah, do I cheapen it by doing that? So the idea is, it's a it's a call that God has placed upon our lives to walk in obedience to Him to develop this to uh, uh, you know to make the investments necessary to watch that kind of growth, uh, but it has nothing to do with making it the kingdom of God because we already know what the kingdom of God is all about, Amen. right? Yeah. The kingdom of God is something that's not tangible to us right now. Uh, we we one day will be in that place where we live with Him eternally, and we've got these, you know, God is 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 building something for us very special. We know that, and and the Bible makes that very very clear. So the whole idea of we're trying to build a sort of a uh, a you know a, a world here that is going to be kingdom influenced. Look, I think it's admirable to say I want to bring Christianity to as many people as I can Amen. because we're called to evangelize. But to say, I'm going to go into all of these dominions, the dominion of media and the Mm -hmm. dominion of this and the dominion of that. Well, listen, you can do that all you want until you're blue in the face. (laughs) But again, it's a form of compartmentalization. That's exactly what it is. My heart is I want to bring Christ into everything in my life. I want to introduce him to every area of my life. and And I want to evangelize people to win them over to Christ. But to say I'm going to take over this dominion or that dominion, I think that language is very, very erroneous. As a matter of fact, I think people come to uh, really, really unbiblical and unsound conclusions because they're really putting, they're not only putting the cart before the horse, they're literally expecting to be the cart to tow the horse that the, ho- the horse doesn't want to move. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's kind of a sad picture, but it's true. And, and I get the efforts that many well-meaning people are making to try to adapt to the dominionist mindset yep. and give it some credibility. But all you're doing is you're working against yourself and you're working against what the kingdom of God actually says concerning these issues. Amen. And and I, I'm sorry. Oh, and then I also see that with trying to have your will be done. Like if you have your church and you're like, we need this group in media, we need this group in politics, we need this group. 
We're supposed to just do what God's calling us to do specifically, and that's what we'll be judged for. Not our will, but your will be done, God. And and so that's where I think it gets scary too. But I also want to talk about, you know, my dad's a pastor, and there's a lot of pastors out there who are afraid to get involved in any way, shape, or form in politics, right? Because there's a lot of woke Christians, and I don't even yep. know if they would be Christ- considered Christians if they're supporting certain people and things that they are but i also want to talk about i remember you shared something yeah. about how in the end days i think it's in luke 17 where it talks about it'll be like the days of noah and lot and yeah, you gave like a yeah. really good example about okay. lot and concerning like yeah. leaders and pastors were you gonna say something? i wanted i wanted to ask though about uh, the 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 um seven hills about saying how they yeah. call you dominionists you and charlie can you explain the misunderstanding of that yeah. is that yeah. here you're saying you want to be a gauge and you want to like, occupy not, but now they're yeah. A lot of times the media or woke Christians will say you're a dominionist mm-hmm. when you yeah. you just said you're not, of course. So how do you, you know, I mean, I think you touched well, on it, but can you make that very clear how you're different than a dominionist? Yeah. Yeah. So it's we an are. unavoidable distinction that people, and it's, it's an unavoidable association because we are walking actively to influence everything that God has put in front of us. Amen. But the difference between me and a dominionist is a dominionist will say, look, I've got these hills of influence yeah. that I have to specifically target, and uh, this is what I have to use uh, in order to make change in whatever arena that I'm in. Well, I staunchly disagree with that. I think mm. it's a hugely erroneous conclusion. People people come to these conclusions by analyzing the effectiveness of what Trump did, which he did. I mean, he used somewhat of an influential dominionist kind of a mindset to do what he did. But but the error, and it is a staunch error amongst Christians, is when you use the dominionist mindset, when you said, look, at here are these, these spheres of influence, these hills of influence, and this is what... Uh, this person did, and this is how he took advantage of media and, you know, all of the things that they talk about. Well, um, you are putting God in a scope. You are limiting him by a scope. So the problem is when you put him in that kind of scope, the he is limited yeah. by the scope that you place him in. And actually, it's more, a, it's more of a description of how you're limiting yourself. Yeah. So when somebody would argue who's a dominionist, oh, we've got to influence these spheres, right? Well, that's obscene. <laughs> and I'll tell you why it's obscene. Because you're cheapening the power of God to influence a whole culture. So the the dominionist might say, well, I've got these seven uh, hills Mm -hmm. of influence that that I go through to be able to come to the conclusions that I come to. And this is why I do what I do. Well, my thing is I don't limit God to seven spheres of influence. Mm -hmm. I actually say, God, whatever you have given me in my life, I'm going to use it for your glory. I'm not going to – now the difference is – if I'm a dominionist, I say, well, I'm going to use these areas to influence people. Well, th- there's a huge problem with that because you're discounting the work of the Holy Spirit in your life and in your heart to empower you to influence culture. So my thing is that, well, as a dominionist, I would say, well, I, you know what? What I'm going to end up doing is I am going to pursue as a dominionist, the area of media, for example. And I'm going to make sure that I fill the area of media with influence that will cause people to receive Christ or walk according to Christ. Mm -hmm. I don't look at it that way. The way I look at it is if God gives me the opportunity to use media, then I view media as a tool Hmm. to do God's work as opposed to and a category that I have to pursue in order to validate what God has already done in me. Because again, when you put God in a scope, mm-hmm. you are limiting his power to the scope that mm-hmm. you actually create. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So to say, oh, there's just seven spheres of influence, well, it's it's remarkably foolish because the erroneous conclusion that demands that you have to use these areas to effectively target somebody is so crazy because you completely discount the power of the Holy Spirit Hmm. in a person's life. So if God has given me the tool of media, I'm going to use that tool for his glory. If God has given me the tool of, uh, you know, whatever other place that I have that might be categorized in one of these hills, then I'm going to use it for his glory because God will use that as opposed to me inserting God into that scope. And that's the problem of what they're doing. They're inserting God into that scope and they're trusting that the scope will actually bring influence to the people, which by the way, can I just tell you, is what Paul put into the category of worldly philosophy. Mm, That's good. Yeah, that's true. So 
And, and I don't think that God needs us about. to bring him back too, right? right. I mean, because yeah. they're going to usher right. in God to come back. I think he can come right. back anytime he wants. He doesn't need our help Listen, to come back. <laughs> if no one, if no one knows the day or the hour of yeah. Christ's return, including Christ himself when he told us about this, yeah. then what makes you think you're going to have any kind of power or ability to actually move the heart of God to actually return for his church? <laughs> That's yeah. obscene. I mean, I mean, don't we believe, right? I mean, I want to make sure you agree with it. But the, re the reason we have to be raptured is because things are going to get crazier, right? I mean, that's right. why we have to be taken out. That's if it was all good, why would we have to be taken from, out? And if, if we that's ushered right. in, Absolutely what do we do? Come right. up, come down? You know, I mean, just, you know, and everything's so Absolutely hybrid right. today. You notice that? Everything's got, well, I'm pre-trib, slight this, you know. But I mean, the old days when I went to Bible college, it was pretty simple. Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. You know, now it's all these tweaks. But, you know, to think that we're going to, somehow make God come back is pretty pretty presumptuous to me, you know. So. Well, and it's because we live in a world where people just make up their own rules and their philosophies, you know. Yeah. We live in the world of, of you know, Hegel's nonsense. We live in a world where, you know, we're postmodernists. We live in a world where there are no absolutes, you know, and that's yeah. kind of the, the, the erroneous way of thinking. I, I think it goes far beyond erroneous way of thinking. I actually think that it's demonically inspired. Yeah, doctors uh, of demons we've seen in the last days, right? Yeah. Right, absolutely. It's what I would call a doctrine of demons, mm. and um, and it's very, very sad because we have really, really solid brothers and sisters in the Lord that are capitulating to the mindset uh, that this produces, and this is why we have so many celebrity passers that are putting on their tight jeans and <laughs> I mean, I have tight jeans, but not because I want them to be tight. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, mine are tight uh, without even. You know, yeah, right, exactly. Tight jeans. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, this this is why we have so many of these celebrity pastors. This yeah. is why we have so many woke pastors yeah. uh, that are out there that that will stand up for those things. You know, uh, I recently went went over this when I was kicked off of a local radio station uh, in Southern California, one of the most popular radio stations in the Calvary Chapel movement. Yeah. It was Pastor Chuck's baby, mm -hmm. and I got kicked off of that radio station because I was taking a stand yeah. on a man who took a, on Lecrae, to be honest yeah. with you, yeah. on Lecrae, yeah. who was supporting, uh, you know, Raphael Warnick, mm -hmm. who is the most pro-abortion person that has ever walked into the Senate floor besides, mm -hmm. of course, our current vice president. Mm -hmm. And so what's, what's very, very interesting was uh, I spoke against him because he had accused Charlie Kirk of being a racist when Charlie Kirk mm -hmm. didn't, you know, he's, he's the farthest thing from a racist, mm -hmm. you know, but this is what happens when men like him cannot formulate arguments. Men like Lecrae cannot formulate an argument with respect to the repudiation of what was actually brought up. Then he will resort to name calling yeah, and he's taking race. advantage of the racial divides, yeah. uh, Right now, he's taking advantage of the constructs of critical race theory to actually m create an o an emotional argument that will discredit uh, Charlie Kirk when Charlie Kirk doesn't have a racist bone in his body. Amen. And so, I mean, it, that's the interesting part about all of this. And so I took a stand against that. Amen. And of course, the pastor that has control over that uh, – kicked me off of the radio station with, that I've been on for almost 10 years. Yeah. And um, I mean, it's okay with us. God really did something yep. special with that. That's a radio yeah. station that is dying a, a very, very uh, slow death and yep. it's bleeding really, really bad. And it's hmm. sad to see that that's the case. Uh, but we were able to go on the largest Christian radio station in the country within less that than a week at the time that we left this. And, and we're now on an, an additional 452 radio wow. stations uh, in 42 different states. So God takes these things and uses for his glory. But what's sad is the person who oversees that radio station, the, 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 the pastor who took over for Chuck Smith, one of the greatest ministries that probably yeah. ever existed yeah. in our yeah. time is a full-blown racist. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't care what anybody says. I will say it Amen. because he believes in the constructs of critical race theory, and he's made it more about that. And there are there are videos of him. I have some that are saved here. There are videos of him where he is actually praising Joe Biden <laughs> on the day that Joe Biden was inaugurated. Wow. He's praising Joe Biden because he says Joe Biden is the first president to ever speak about racial injustice. Wow. Now, first of all, that statement is one of the most ignorant, uneducated statements on the face of the earth, yeah. especially for any American that should really understand his history, right? But it's extraordinarily racist yeah. and it's ignorant. It's completely ignorant. He is making this issue about the color of somebody's skin with instead of the content of a person's character. Yep. And so um, it's sad that that's what's going on, but we are seeing that. And it is. It's infiltrating everywhere, not just yeah. – 
you know, other people that we would expect it to infiltrate. No, this is coming into the Calvary chapels. Yeah, it's crazy. It's Are you, so were you considered find. a racist because of that? Mm. Were you, were you called, cause you kind oh, of yeah, dark no, skin. Certainly, <laughs> certainly. I, I, You're a dark skin racist. I, listen, listen, <laughs> I, first of all, let me just simply say this when it comes oh. to critical race theory and critical theory in specific, I do not believe in intersectionality. Okay. Mm. It's absolutely ridiculous to think that an immutable characteristic, uh, particularly the color of my skin yeah. Or uh, anything else determines my moral authority. The yeah. determining of my moral authority is based on what God's yeah. word says, right? Yeah. John said it in John 1 1. He said, in in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus is the living, breathing, dynamic word of God that never changes. And my moral authority that I, that I stand on is based on that living word as John defines it. And so one of the things that we have to understand is that um, knowing that fact, look. I, my mom and my dad were both born and raised in Egypt. I'm first generation born into this country. Mm. Egypt is not an Arab nation. You go to an Egyptian and you call an Egyptian an Arab, they'll kick you in the face. Okay, <laughs> that's a, that's the reality. I come from a North African country. The black population in this country is 13 percent. My population is literally represented by one percent, one percent in this country. So if you do want to create the argument from the basis of intersectionality, which I absolutely hate because there's no reason why my moral authority should be based on that. Matter of mm -hmm. fact, our founding fathers understood that mm -hmm. when they wrote the Declaration of Independence and when they wrote the Constitution. Give me a break. Uh, you know, nature and nature is God. Are you yeah. kidding me? Certain unalienable rights endowed by our creator. The, people look at the, the, the Bill of Rights and we look at, you know, uh, all of the Bill of Rights. And especially when we start talking, talking about the First Amendment, listen, the First Amendment is not... A, a, based on the idea that government gives people their rights. It's a direct repudiation to that mm -hmm. mindset. The First Amendment protects the rights that have been given to us by our creator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so the idea here is the mindset that men like Brian Broderson and all of those guys yeah. are thinking is they're adopting to the ideas of the 1619 Project, which basically, which basically says that our country has been systemically racist from the beginning. Forget the fact when you bring up slavery, because that's the number one argument that mm -hmm. they'll bring. Forget the fact that there were 16,500 black slave traders in the country early on at that time. Forget the fact that the greatest number of slaves in existence are literally alive right now mm -hmm. on this earth. And the United States of America still serves as a shining light mm -hmm. and a beacon uh, to repudiate that nonsense, Amen. right? And forget about the fact that the number one purveyor of slaves back then is the same purveyor of slaves today, and that's the Arab, the Arab Muslim. Yeah. So, so forget all that, right? And forget about the fact that the, the Declaration of Independence, as well as a constitution, was written as a referendum to slavery. It was a 25-year mm -hmm. referendum. They said, basically, we want to eliminate it by this. Forget the fact that the Republican Party was started as an abolitionist movement. <laughs> there wasn't a single Republican that actually owned <laughs> slaves. So, so that Lincoln was Republican. People say, forget that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we can go back and we can yeah. say, oh, well, you know, all these people were racist. And yes, there was a lot of racism that went on in mm. this country. Listen, the 1960s, even up in the 1960s, it was really, really bad. But think of the words of, of Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King, when he, when he gave his I Have a Dream speech, he said that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution was a promissory note not to black yet. Americans that had not yet been cashed on. Yep. And he was right. They had not yet cashed on the promissory note of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Well, what does he mean yeah. when he says it? I can tell you this. He would have hated the words yeah. of the 1619 Project yeah. because – what MLK was basically recognizing was the truth about the founding fathers in that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they drafted a set of documents that basically stipulated through and through that men were supposed to be recognized by the content of their character Amen. and Amen. not by the color of their skin. Yeah. And that's what's and wild. We're going backwards on yeah. that. You know, now we have right. the vote, you know, the what is it, black businesses and everything. I mean, Martin Luther King would say that's everything I fought against, right? It's I mean, obscene. It's just and, and we're living in a time that's more racist than possible. Well, yep. listen, and it's cool now. Like, as long as you're not whitey, it's cool to oh, be racist and well, say well, hire black people. Don't you know? I mean, how who would say that? We say you know we have a lot of black people in our church, and they say, hey, we want to be judged by our character. We don't want it to be, hey, give me a job because I'm black yeah. because I because I'm qualified because I work hard, you know. And it's it's just it's amazing how. Like we say, what we learn from history is we learn nothing from history. We're just repeating the same old garbage instead of saying, wait a sec, let's be men and women of character, and we want to be judged by that. Amen. Well, and it's so sad. I, I, I watched an interview years ago 
uh, when Brian was interviewing Miles McPherson over the new book that Miles McPherson had written, which, by the way, there's a lot of stuff that's not factual in that book. Mm-hmm. But we'll leave that be. I'm not even going to talk about that. But he went on talking about his white privilege. Mm-hmm. And I think about that. And I'm, I'm like, wait, hold on for a second. Do you understand how incredibly racist your assertion of white privilege actually is? Yeah. Mm-hmm. By you saying I have white privilege, you're basically saying I apologize because the color of my skin creates an element of superiority yeah. to you, and I apologize for being superior to you. Yeah. Mm. I can't think of anything more racist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are we, more, are we more racially divided now than we were 10 years ago? The answer to that is, yes. oh, yes, yes, we are. Yep. And when Black Lives Matter, and by the way, I don't believe in saying Black Lives Matter as an organization or as a statement, I believe in all lives matter. Amen. And I know that there's exactly. a lie that everybody's throwing around that says, well, if you say all lives matter, then you're diminishing black lives. No, I'm not. As a matter of fact, I'm elevating black lives in this country. You're talking to a man who's married to a black woman. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm sorry about your nonsense in your conclusions with this, but I'm fighting for my children. Mm-hmm. I'm fighting for my wife. I'm fighting for my family because I don't want a society that has the views of BLM who absolutely hates me as a father. BLM hates me being a father. They stand for yeah. the destruction of the Western prescribed. I don't even know what Western prescribed means. The Western prescribed nuclear family. They want to destroy families. And, that, and and when you say, I believe in the statement, but I don't believe in the organization, you can say that to your blue in the face, mm. but you are about as smart as a bag of rocks because by making <laughs> the statement, you are supporting, you are supporting the organization. Yeah. You need to come up with a different way. Be creative. You all are intelligent. God gave you great intelligence. You need to come up with a different way to say that black lives are precious. I can make one recommendation. Can I make one recommendation yeah. to say black it. lives are precious? How about we stop the aborting of 1,500 Amen. black babies every single day? Amen. That's a great way to start by saying Black Lives Matter. Black mm-hmm. Lives Matter when you stop those abortions. Yet those same people that march with them, people like Brian Broderson okay. and all of these other guys that actually take a stand for the statement, they say, oh, I believe in the statement, but I don't believe in the organization. Okay, why aren't you talking about abortions? I'll tell you why. They're not even talking about abortions. They're minimizing the argument of abortions mm-hmm. in the name of racial justice, except for one problem. And this is so true, and we've got to understand this. And Brian and men like him, Tony Clark and some of these other guys, they need to wake up to one very simple truth. And that is Proverbs chapter 28, verse 5 tells us, Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand all. Mm-hmm. So why, as a Christian, am I adapting to the philosophies of evil men when they continue to use and propagate the nonsense that they do. Yeah. It's nothing but pure evil. And when the church adopts it and brings it as a philosophy into their own heart, they're literally hurting themselves. And by the way, they are destroying the culture of the people that they're claiming to defend. Mm. Right? That's good. And, and a lot of the people too are just... Oh, sorry. Hey, James, no, I just... James, I just wish you'd be a little more bold. You know, just, <laughs> I you wish you could just speak your heart. <laughs> I love it because people say I'm pretty bold, but you make me feel like a little two-year-old. So uh, thank you for that. Look, here's here's, (laughs) here's the deal. Look, no man who's worth a dime who goes into battle, right, uh, ever thinks that they're going to come out of the battle living. Yeah. Hmm. If you're if you're good at, at if you are good at war, then every battle you fight, you are expecting to die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've already been, we're dead in Christ, yeah. right? I mean, we're alive in Christ, dead to the flesh. You know, we've been resurrected in newness of life, but the flesh in me is dead. So you know what? I'm already dead. So I'm going to fight the battle yeah. understanding that I've already died. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that I am fighting for people's lives. I do care about uh, other races. I do care about all of that. I mean, Amen. even, listen, we have we have been so exposed to the lies of the enemy for so long that even to say the type of things that I say, people call me, oh, oh, this is hate speech. Like, here's, here's a great example. We do Black History Month. Mm-hmm. Why? Okay, so why are we doing Black History Month? Hmm. Are we doing it so that we can actually just simply coddle one nation of people because of the color of their skin based yeah. on some harms and horrible things that were done in the past. Listen, I, look, I could look <laughs> 2019, 2019 mm. law enforcement made somewhere in the neighborhood of 385 million contacts with citizens. Some people say that that's a really high number. Some people say it's as high as 85 million. Let's just take the 85 million number, right? Let's just do that. Let's just say that there were 85 million citizen contacts that were made by law enforcement in 2019. Okay. Okay. Of that, there were a 1,000 officer-involved shootings. Of the officer-involved shootings, a 1,000 officer-involved shootings, there were 40 that were unarmed. Mm -hmm. Of the 40 that were unarmed, do you know how many were white? Mm -hmm. 19. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many were black? Nine. 
And of the nine black people that were uh, involved in shootings that were unarmed, six of them were actually trying to or attempting to take the weapon of the officer. Mm. And of those six, there were three that have video to prove it. Yeah. Mm. Now you tell me, a law enforcement officer right now today is 18 and a half times more likely to be killed by a black man than a black man is to be killed by a law enforcement officer. Yeah. So you tell me, uh, what, what, what truth do I serve? Mm. What benefit do I serve to black people by telling them the police are hunting you? It's a lie. Yeah. It's based on racism. Here's, some, here's a new fact. If you really want to fight for black people in, in the community, you really want to fight for, for those families and really make sure that they're doing better, how about this? How about in, 19, in the 1960s, there were something like 15 to 18, maybe as high as 20% of all black families did not have a father yeah. in that family, yeah, right? That's right? When you go to early 1900s, 1911, there was roughly 11% of those families that did not have a father. So you have Lyndon Bay Johnson, who, by the way, they call him a hero for pushing the signing of the Civil Rights Act. And Lyndon Bay Johnson, forgive me for saying this, I won't say the word. Lyndon Bay Johnson uh, uh, literally, uh, with respect to the Civil Rights Act, says, if we can get this signed, then we'll have these ends. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm going to say wow. when I say ends, right? We'll have these ends voting for us for the next 200 years. Wow. That was his reading for wanting to sign the Civil Rights Act. Mm -hmm. And everybody who oppose the Civil Rights Act were all Democrats. And don't say that Democrats have sort of flipped themselves with the Republicans. The Democrats are the most racist organization yeah. in the country. They are more racist than the than the uh, Nazi Klansmen. They're more racist than every organization. You, they are the most racist organization of people in this country for lots of reasons. But he signs that, and then you have this New Deal, right? Yep, You've got this deal, whole yeah. societal thing that he, that he does, and he goes to black mothers, and he says, we will supplement your income for your children so long as there are no fathers yeah. in the house. Yeah. Yeah. So now we go from 18 to 20% of black families that don't have fathers in them to now 75% yeah. to almost 80% have no black families. That's the problem. The yeah. problem is not systemic racism. The problem is the policies of a very racist left organization called the Democrats who basically did everything that they could to dismantle what mm. God's prescription is for a successful family and a successful household. There's your problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And There's as Dinesh, Dinesh D'Souza called it, the, the inner city is the new plantation, right? I mean, it became... That's exactly yeah. right. It's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. They continue to be, and only because of the encouragements. And I know that there are lots of people in be bad. Well, you don't understand what it's like to live in my skin. You're a liar. <laughs> You're just a li How in the world can you look at me and say I don't understand? Yep, exactly. My dad was a victim of real racism. Yeah. You guys hear a few hard words every now and then. My dad lost his job over the color of his skin yeah. wow. and had to go through a horrendous time. And you know what? My dad never told me about it. You know the only wow. way I found out about my dad going through that was years and years and years later in my adult life going through – a magazine clipping, seeing a picture of my dad getting uh, his money back from Los Angeles County because a racist boss actually fired him. And I asked my dad, I said, Dad, why don't you tell me about this in the six months that you didn't have a job? We didn't even know you didn't have a job. Mm -hmm. He said, what good would it have done to you? Wow. Wow. Yeah. Good. What good would have done to you? I was with you. Christ was with us. We just keep moving forward mm -hmm. and look at how much God has blessed our family. Praise wow. God. Amen. Yeah, that's you that's something to touch on right there too. As I've just been dealing with that, I want to get onto this because you have your question about the lot and stuff. But it's so wild how the victim mentality of Christians today. Yep. You know, it's so funny. I say I that how we talk it. about how we don't want to be part of the left and be on the government breast. But yet so many of us are victimized and we do feed off that and we all have, you know, disabilities and we mental problems, you know, we have people and it's like if you're truly disabled, I get yeah. it, but you know what I mean? But we we say how much we don't want the government to rule our lives, but so many people feed off it, even Christians. And we need to say, no, God's created us. I always say what I don't like about modern day Christianity is it doesn't seem that Jesus works. Mm -hmm. And it's not, of course, Jesus' problem is that we don't really surrender our life to him and believe, yeah. wait a second, I don't have to believe. You know, I was raised in, you know, an organ, hippie, mm -hmm. you know, hated Reagan. And then as soon as I became a Christian, my whole mindset changed almost overnight. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know why I hated Reagan. I didn't know anything about him. I just hated him because I was a liberal and my liberal family hated him. But it's amazing how when we have the mind of Christ, 
how things should really change. But a lot of times that we're seeing the woke pastors, we're going backwards yeah. instead of letting Christ really free us from those wrong right. thinkings and that, you know, I'm, I'm chained by, you know, what the world's done to me. We're not supposed to be victims in Christ. We're supposed to be victorious. We're supposed to be overcomers through Christ That's and right. not keeping the old way of life. Amen. Yeah. Exactly. Why don't you ask your question? And then so, I, thanks so I, much, James. Man, you're awesome, dude. I want to have you come. Glad, you ever I'm come speak at churches? Huh? You have to come speak at. You ever come to Tucson? Oh. You got to come speak at a church one time. <laughs> I'd be happy to do it. We just got to nail down the dates and everything. It'd be a cool, lot of bro. fun. I'd, I'd love to do that. All right, and, ask you. Um, like you were saying, a lot of young people, especially, they always feel like offended and we always call them like snowflakes everything if you say something <laughs> but again that's why they don't like discipline right the bible says that god disciplines he, those he loves like a father disciplines his favorite child fathers now are being so belittled and told you're nothing and women need to rise up and this feminist movement is just so sick like i believe that you know women you know they can speak but they have to be like me i'm submitted to my dad i'm not a pastor i'm not like i am under the covering of my father but i think so many people get upset with that and and i that's why i want you to kind of talk about lot like it talks about in the days of lot because I I don't mm. think he really was standing up like he should have like and write his wife. I don't really know a lot about that situation. I know she turned into a pillar of salt, but it just seems like with what he was doing, it was more like he was kind of going along with maybe what's what other people wanted, right? What they wanted. He was giving he was going right. to give his daughters. He was a woke judge. To, yeah, he was a woke <laughs> judge it seemed like, but yet, right, I know how you talk about in the New Testament he was still counted as righteous. So can you explain, you were explaining that with like the end times with and Rob. just getting back to that with Rob. And I don't know if you want to share that or even know yeah, what I'm saying. I'm, but I'm, I'm going to give you a Reader's Digest of it. Yeah. If you want a, a longer one of it, um, it was a video that I did with Tom Hughes when I was at his church on a Sunday night. Uh, we did it together. I think it was maybe, I don't know, I want to say three or four months ago mm, okay. uh, where I talk about it at length, but I want to respect your time constraints. Yeah. So uh, the, 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 the greatest problem with a lot uh, really, and it was a huge problem, was the fact that Lot, you know, and, and to go through this, it's actually really simple. You can see the progression, right? Lot saw the area of Sodom. He knew, right, that that general idea was going to be better uh, for the flesh, right? Yeah, so he took advantage of that. He knew that it would be easier. He went the easier route. The Bible says he pitched his tent towards Sodom, right, which is a huge error because what he did was he positioned himself to look at the ways of the world. And the of comfort. course, before you know it, he was there in Sodom. He was literally acting as one of the elders in Sodom. He was one of these guys that was completely given to it. Now, the problem with that was, although he had some uh, ailments of righteousness in him, right? And I do say ailments because <laughs> the righteousness that he did have in him was very broken. That was yeah. a very purposeful statement, right? Um, he gets told that it's time to leave. He he gets told that it's time to leave, and yet it's very obvious that he was conflicted with leaving. Yeah, yeah. It's very obvious that he had a very hard time with it, to the point where the mindset of Sodom had so permeated the heart of Lot that Lot was willing to give his daughters to be brutally raped and potentially yeah, killed. That's crazy. Right? And people look at him and say, well, he was admirable because he was seeking to save the angels, when in reality it was a reflection of the uh, of the perversion that have developed within Lot's mind and heart because he gave himself to the culture. Yeah. Lot would have been a woke pastor exactly. if he was a guy at the time. He would have been a guy that believed in the Black Lives Matter movement. He would have been a guy that would have believed in the 1619 Project, that kind of a thing. And yet there was, uh, there was enough of an element of righteousness in him where God actually had to shake up his life yeah. and he had to, uh, to move on. But what was very, very interesting, if you remember what happened, Lot ends up up wanting to put himself in a place where he was still close to Sodom. Yeah. Mm. He he actually wanted to go hang out for a little while very nearby yeah, and we'll kind of maybe see if things were going to change. And I mean, that's really what was going on because the attachment of his heart was into the culture of yeah. the time that was propagated by the evil and satanic inspiration of the people of that land. And he had never, the condemnation of Lot, the worst part about Lot has nothing to do with the fact that lots of people traditionally speak about, you know, his decision for Sodom and Gomorrah and all this other stuff. The, the greatest repudiation of Lot was his love for the world and the influence that that had upon him yeah. where he was no longer, he was so, uh, so diminished, so damaged by his attachment to the culture 
of that time that he failed to take a stand the way he was called to take a stand. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the problem. And that's really where the condemnation uh, lied. And it's very, very obvious that that was the case. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you think about it, if you think about it, look at his in-laws. Mm-hmm. Look at the people that he's trying to convince them to leave. Come with no, us. And they're calling him crazy. Exactly. Yeah. They're looking at him at, as a kook. Why are they looking at him as a kook? Because it was inconsistent with the philosophy, the heart and the mind that he was communicating with them the whole time. See, that's the problem. Yeah. Right. And then later on, you see some of the evils that were done with his daughters and, and some of the things that were going on. It was a reflection of the fact that his mind and his heart was completely destroyed. It was it was literally perverted by the culture that he caused himself to be given to, and that's exactly what we're dealing with right now with the woke mentality yeah. in the pastors that we're looking at. Yeah. So, Pastor James, would you say like because you know, like you said, you don't want to be obnoxious, you don't want to just be shock value, but yet yeah. you know the problem is it seems like too many pastors. It's like what is the old worldly saying? If you try to please everyone, you end up pleasing no one. And what did right. Jesus say to you? Woe to you when all men speak well of you like they did the false prophets. And so we right. need to write, I mean, we don't want to offend just to offend, just to get clicks right. or whatever, we but we want to speak the truth. Gospel. And they're, you know, if they, what did you say? If they hate me, they're going to hate you. A servant's not greater than his master, but it seems like, right. right, the woke, really the issue of lot, the issue with woke pastors is they want everyone to love right. them. Yep. And what That's we got right. to really worry about more is standing for righteousness and truth and being right with God, right? Because mm-hmm. right. the fear of man right. will prove to be a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord is kept safe, right? I mean, you know, you, right. you just said you were kicked off a radio station. Yep. What did God do? He gave you a yeah. better radio station. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, and, and Absolutely. like we always say, too, we don't fight just when we like our, you heard this. I forget which congressman or someone said that the, 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 the we fight until we lose. But they, the left, fights until they win. Mm. But we have to have that heart, right? Amen. We have to keep fighting right. until there's no breath in our lungs, right? Amen. Until we're and either raptured or beyond that. And, I, and I, not to correct you, but I no, think we, no. I, I, that's what I'm doing. That's not what I'm doing. But I, what, what I want you to understand here is that, that the way the left looks at it is also wrong. Yeah. Because if we say I'm going to fight until we win, we create a significant problem with us, right? To say I'm going to fight until I win, it basically says, well, once I'm there, then I'm good and I can mm. rest. Right? Oh, yeah. What the Bible yeah. tells us is we fight because God tells us to fight. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, we that's what I mean. We just keep fighting, right? So, we don't, yeah, we've, yeah. even so if, if we, because right, we know right. biblically we're going to lose someday if we, yeah. if, 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 if right. Larry ter- tarries. I mean, I mean, there's going to be a time we have to be raptured because we, God in us has no more salt and light, right? Agree. Right. So, but we don't quit fighting because we don't want to be the wicked, lazy servant, right? We don't want to say, right. oh, "I'm tired, sorry," you know. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely yeah. correct. And that's the mindset, right? That's the idea. That's the yeah. heart. That's uh, that's what we need to have. And that's what I meant. I meant by God win, meaning win with God, that we don't quit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. It, we, it's defining terms, right? Yeah. Winning to us is obedience. Amen. That's really yeah. the best way to define it. And Amen. he endures winning, to the end. I mean, obedience. you know, yeah, that we need to, because right. I exactly. also, I just preached uh, this Sunday about Occupy, about the cowardice will go into the lake of fire. We don't ever think about that, that people, well, I'm just shy. I'm timid. I'm not mm. bold. I'm not a jerk like you, Pastor Craig or Pastor James. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. really a nice person. <laughs> well, no, but it says the cowardice will we'll enter the kingdom and so we have or the, no. the lake of fire and so we have to be concerned with that and then it says fight the good fight you know what i mean and we have to realize right you'll say jesus has already won the war Amen. we're just to win do our best to win as many battles as we can for the souls of men right. to influence the culture for christ to try to spread the the. i mean we know a lot of people aren't going to receive it if they rejected jesus they're going to reject us because we're not perfect message like christ but we don't quit fighting because Jesus fought for us, and we, in love, need to fight for other people, for them to come to know Christ. And so, and we also that's the like yeah, my dad always says, like Ezekiel thirty three, we're supposed to warn the people, right? But we can't like law, try to warn the people if we ourselves are not living a godly life that we can say, "Follow me as I follow Christ." Right. And and that's where I really think that we can't compromise and say, "Oh, I need to get as close." To media and these people and i know a lot of girls that i know are guys they do missionary dating like oh i might save them it's like no we need to be so set apart so radical right. like the bible says in revelation you're either hot or cold if you're lukewarm i'll spit you out just go all out for jesus all out for the lord and he will direct us he will direct our paths like we're not calvinists but we do believe god is sovereign right he mm-hmm. is in yeah, control right. but we also know we have free will so I mean, I'm just thankful for you because I see that passion in you to not want to compromise, to stand for truth. 
we always say this. We're like, you're not a pa- you're not an evangelifish. You're you're a true evangelical <laughs> pastor that fights and stands yeah, yeah. up. So we're There's thankful for you. But yeah. I know we are out of time. But do you want to share anything else to our listeners? And then you know, then just, like, yeah, just to pray. say, because you mentioned it just a second ago. You know, just to say that it's our call to just trust in the Lord with all of these things. You know, I mean, even look I, in April, I'm coming up on five years married to my wife. Mm-hmm. Okay, and here's the thing that's really interesting about that. Um, the way I met her was really unique. Uh, I, I, I saw her in my church service. I looked at her and God said, that's going to be the woman you marry. Now I thought, oh, that's, that's a little crazy. And I make a long story short cause it, it, it is a kind of a long story. But, um, the first five minutes of my second conversation with my wife, which the first conversation was five minutes, right? Mm-hmm. So the second five minutes, that's, I've only been talking to her for 10 minutes now, right? I tell her, look, Here's the bottom line. I feel like God's told me we're going to get married, and I, I think you feel the same, and then that's a wrap. I formally proposed to her after talking to you know her parents a month later, wow. right? And then we got married less than nine months after that, wow. and we have had an amazing marriage. Uh, and, 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 and by the way, never been in a relationship prior to her. My uh-huh. wife is, was in the same category. Just trust in the Lord. He'll bring the right person, and um, it is a, a, an absolutely wonderful time. That's I, I've been blessed. To, cool. to be able to experience everything that I God that. has given me. And so the bottom line is this, trust in the Lord. Amen. Yeah. And I that's think a good word for my girl. She's trusting God. It's a form. <laughs> With all your heart. <laughs> She's yeah, waiting for a right. good man. Yeah. So. yeah, and you know what? Listen, uh, and don't compromise. Amen. Don't Amen. don't give in to the first donkey that looks at you. <laughs> you so beautiful and all that. Don't listen to those knuckleheads. So. You, you need to look for a person who says, I'm being led by the Lord to make the decisions that I make. Uh, because if you find a man who loves God more than he loves you, you'll always be loved in the best way possible. Amen. And, th- and that's just reality. And, and all of us need to understand that. And uh, when you do, you'll see that God rewards those who earnestly, earnestly seek, seek him, him and put him first. Amen. And, 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 and that really comes down to that whole uh, thing of being bold. Amen. Uh, it, you know, I trust that God is watching over me and that he's going to continue to defend us as we do what he's called us to do. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Well, Amen. we love that. Um, can you tell our listeners where they can find uh, the your YouTube or also your website? Sure. sure. Yeah. So our YouTube channel is uh, Calvary Chapel Signal Hill. You just type it in like that or you can search my name. Typically, you'll find Calvary Chapel Signal Hill. We'd love for you to subscribe yeah. to that. Uh, I'm also on Instagram as James Cadiz. That's James K A D D I S. We're on Rumble, Rumble.com slash James Cadiz. Um, I'm on Parlor, uh, so we're there as well. I'm also on Facebook uh, at Calvary Chapel Signal Hill, and of course our website is CalvaryChapelSignalHill.com. So CalvaryChapelSignalHill.com, and uh, we have, and we also have a Calvary Chapel Signal Hill app. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of Bible studies that are available to you for free. And um, well over a thousand videos on YouTube that we've produced in the last six months. Uh, I would probably say at least that many wow. that we've produced in the last six months that are available to you that uh, will go over all of those things. Please take advantage of that. All free. There's no attachments uh, at all with that. No obligation. And we just want you to be blessed. So that's that's all of it. Praise wow. God. And we'll have that all in the description below. So everyone go check that out. Subscribe to Calvary Chapel Signal Hill. And would you pray for us before? Pray for the boldness of yeah, pastors. I really want because I, I really love, love your spirit. It. I want to yeah. see that spread throughout yeah. the Calvary movement and other churches, of course. But I really would like to see because you know, like you, I think you said that with uh, Rob, that kind of the hippie movement, like Chuck, don't get involved right. politics. But I think that day Amen. is past, Amen. right? Because I've seen, I, I'm sure you have. We have a little church, you know. If the, we have about 100 people, maybe 150. If everyone would show up, but. Um, but it's like our church is growing yeah. for being bold and standing yeah. up. And it's so I think people are, getting, right. people are getting tired of yeah. kind of the milk toast churches. And so would you really pray gospel. for the listeners and for those, especially Absolutely. leaders to really Amen. step up Amen. and God's using you guys. So just keep doing it, right? Just mm-hmm. stand, stand, uh, stand firm. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, first of all, for the people of Calvary Oro Valley. Mm-hmm. We pray that in the name of Jesus, you would just anoint them and that you would use them, Lord, for your glory and for your purposes, Lord. We know Arizona is also a place that desperately needs you, like every other part of the world. And we just pray, Lord, for your hand and your blessing to be upon them. Lord, we pray that you would grow the fellowship more than they even know what to do with, Lord. And we pray, God, that you would bless this amazing family, uh, that you would just be with them and fill them with your spirit and give them inspiration and wisdom, Lord, to do the things, Lord, that you've called them to. So, Lord, uh, we just give them to you. We just ask for the filling and the anointing of your spirit. And we pray for boldness in the church like we've never seen before, not just Calvary chapels, but all over the world. 
that we would find ourselves in a position where we would take a stand for righteousness Amen. and speak against these evils, Lord, that we would be on the right side of history, standing mm. for truth. So, Lord, we love you and we thank you. We look to you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, bro. Thank you so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you would like to listen to us wherever you get your podcast, just type in Calvary Conversations. Also, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Calvary Conversations. You can also check out our new merch in the description below. Thanks so much, guys, and God bless. Good job, Mike.